Hi, everyone. Welcome to our latest edition of Supernova Commencements. I'm your host, Kashi Segel, and we have a great show for you today. Somebody really legendary, frankly, from a computing perspective. Um, but before we get to that, I want to welcome all of you students, graduates, young professionals, all of you who are joining us, uh, we love having you every week and we love your questions. So uh, get those ready. Um, we are going to bring our guest on screen. Rich DeMillo, welcome. Hi, Kashi. Hi, everyone. How are you? I'm good. Good. So everyone, we, he is very distinguished. Let me tell you a little bit about Rich. He was the past director of um, a cent, the, what's called the Center for 21st Century Universities at Georgia Tech. It's basically the future of education. Um, he's done a lot of writing about that too as an author. Um, he's the former Dean of the College of Computing at Georgia Tech. He was the first CTO of HP. I could go on and on and on. Um, he started like four departments at Georgia Tech. We were just talking about um, how one of them is the largest computing department in the world, right? College of right. Computing. Yep. Um, so anyways, very, we're very lucky to have him today and you are lucky that you get to talk to him. So uh, Rich, please tell us a little bit about you. Where did you go to school? Um, what did you major in? Give us a little bit of backstory. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for the for the invitation. Um, um, so I'm I'm uh, old. Um, I'm older than older than than um, probably anyone else on the, the broadcast. Um, I, I grew up in northern Minnesota. So so this is this is like iron ore mining um, country uh, and um, kind of kind of rural. Um, I just happened to live in a in a in a town uh, that had a really terrific high school, uh, and um, the science teachers in my in my school uh, were sort of all in on on kids getting involved. So so I was a science nerd. I mean, from from really as long as I can remember, um, I was I was tearing things apart and not being able to put them back together. Learning how to build um, build radios. Um, I, um, I was a, a kind of kid that watched science fiction movies uh, a lot. So, you know, these, these old 1950s science fiction movies where there's some secret laboratory in the desert and, and some gray-haired scientist is driving a Jeep out to the laboratory to save the world. Um, those are the kinds of movies I, I watched. And, and I just remember really early thinking that looks really cool. I want to, I want to do something um, like that. So, so that was my, that was my, my life um, very early, basically from junior high school on. Uh, and, and um, you know, when I, when I graduated from high school in the mid sixties, um, I went to um, a liberal arts college in St. Paul, Minnesota called St. Thomas university. Um, just a small liberal arts place came to Georgia Tech for graduate school, um, and this was this was a time before really computers were were available to the to the masses. Um, it's it's interesting. So so I didn't see a computer until I got to um, to college, and the only reason that I saw a computer was that some rich alumnus had made a gift of a computer to St. Thomas. Um, and, and I managed to get a job in the computer center. Um, and that's, you know, I was used to tearing things apart and putting them back together. So that's what I, that's what I did. Um, so I decided again, really early that I love, I love this kind of technology. Uh, and when I found out as I was graduating from college, that there was a thing called computer science, um, cause there wasn't when I started college, but, but by the time I graduated there, there, there was, um, I looked for places that were doing, um, graduate degrees in computer science. Georgia tech was one of the few. Uh, so I came to Atlanta, uh, and, uh, I've been in Atlanta with side trips to California and New Jersey and Italy and, 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 and places in, be in between, but, but for the last, um, 50, plus years, Atlanta has been my home and Georgia Tech has been my passion. It's pretty amazing that 
you got into computer science, it was such an unknown thing, but you knew that you had a passion for it. So you, you kind of just trusted that this was the right thing for you to be in. Can you talk a little bit about how you made that decision? Um, well, it, it, it clicked. Remember, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a science fiction nut. Uh, and, and so it, 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 it clicked with a kid who was used to reading about robots and, and, and artificial brains and that sort of, sort of thing. And that would have been really abstract to me. Um, mm. except that um, they gave me this computer in the computer center that I could I could play with and so I got to write programs um, that were really cool I got to do things that um, that I had thought about before uh, and um, you know it's a field where where the feedback is pretty immediate so if you if you if you put the time and effort into learning uh, how to um, how to code uh, for example, and you have something you, you, you want to do with it, you see it immediately. It's, it's not like building a product where you have to wait for someone to build a factory in order to see your, your stuff being used. Um, you get to put it to use right away. Uh, and and I, I just, I, I like that immediate feedback of the field. And the challenge is is not against so much the laws of, of, of nature it's it's kind of the laws of logic. Um, you know how much how, how much can I do with this with this machine? How much can I do to mimic what human beings do? Uh, and and that's kind of a, a inescapable challenge. I mean, if you if you if you if you get caught up in in, in trying to push the frontiers of knowledge in that particular direction, um, then from the nineteen sixties on, you know that's that's the future of the world. Sure. It's interesting that you've been able to see, you're really a futurist. I mean, you've really been able to see what's coming and what's next and how to pioneer these things. Um, talking about the future of things and what comes next, uh, you've done a lot of talking about this when it comes to education. Right. Um, and you've written several books. Um, the first one is Abelard to Apple. Um, which I cannot find in my house. But the other one is Revolution to Higher Education, How a Small Band of Innovators Will Make a College Accessible and Affordable. Uh, this is really just, we're talking about, first of all, you should all buy this and all the other books. Um, so these are really talking about how to think about education differently in a time like in terms of systems, in terms of how to treat the learning process and the future of school, really, if we had listened to you sooner, we'd be better prepared, I think, now for what we're all dealing with. How could yeah. we have been better prepared? Yeah, so so you're 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 right. I mean, Georgia Tech, I, I think, has weathered the storm um, it, as much as any institution can. Uh, the the COVID storm um, by having made this investment in the, in the past. So, so we converted um, a couple thousand courses to online uh, format essentially overnight. Um, and and the, the, reason, the reason that we were able to do that is, that is that we had spent 10 years experimenting with how this stuff was going to, was going to look at a time when people were, frankly speaking, pretty, um, pretty suspicious of online delivery of, of education. Uh, for for good reason, really. I mean, the, the 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 history of what technology can do for education is kind of checkered. Um, you know, lots of promises um, of, of we're going to revolutionize how people people learn that never seem to pan out. Um, but but when we when we started to do this in my in my center, we kind of took the old experiences, put them aside, and said, so how would we do this better? Um, what what can technology do um, that um, that makes it that makes it less expensive to educate people that makes the outcomes um, outcomes better and so we, we we built a view of education that I think was novel um, at the at the time and we're reaping the benefits of that right um, right now um, it, it's still it's still a, a case that people are are um, are suspicious I think of uh, of online education and and you hear in the news the, the phrase remote education I hate remote education 
Um, there's nothing remote ab about it. Um, but but the idea that 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 technology, if you use it properly, if you re-engineer an industry, can make the industry better, is not something I invented. That's that. That's you know fifty years of history of, of computer um, technology, but but you 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 have to approach it with a commitment to to change the way that you do things. You can't just you can't just point a GoPro camera at the front of a classroom uh, and have people fall asleep, you know, watching some gray-haired person like me <laughs> drone on for which I'm doing right now, drone on for 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 an hour or so. You, it has to be interactive. There has to be a way for. For people to, to stay engaged uh, and, and we were able to figure that out. Sure. Do you think there's room for students to make suggestions to their professors on what would be more engaging? Do you think professors are open to feedback like that right now? Uh, some of them, yeah. I mean we, we, um, we, we built um, a set of technologies with that in, in in mind. One of the things that I talk about in um, um, in in the book you held up, Re Revolution, um, is 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 how um, how professors kind of place themselves at the center of the universe and think that 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 you know because because we're delivering the lectures and delivering the grades that somehow we have a magical role to play. Uh, in all of this, and and um, uh, it's it's great that that human beings are involved and communicate with each other, but but it's a mistake to think to think that 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 alone gives you anything. And and what what computers give you um, is the ability to to mass customize. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of reaping the benefits today. Of the computerized revolution, computer revolution in manufacturing, we can we can get customized components, um, uh, of very high quality goods delivered delivered to us, and and we all like, or at least some of us like, the the targeted suggestions on Amazon and uh, and you know, all of the things that that we that we that we get that seem like they're directed towards us. If you apply that in education, it's 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 an almost irresistible call because because the whole idea of education is that is, is that you want to address the needs of an individual student as they progress at their individual pace. That's really tough to do if you've got a classroom of 300 students. If you're standing in front of a lecture hall, there's 300 students there, or like Harvard's um, computer, introductory computer science course, it's 800 students in a lecture hall. You know, it's just a sea of faces. Um, when people move to technology to deliver the, those kinds of courses, all of a sudden it becomes it becomes 800 individual voices that you can distinguish one from the other, and and and, and you can, with a touch of a button, pace your delivery to the needs of an individual student, and you can tell when a stu student is struggling, and you can tell when the student is um, uh, is not engaged in the classroom classroom discussion. Uh, and do something about it. That's very difficult to do when you have a football stadium full of students. That's what technology buys you. Yeah, so it's a way to work together with the human element. You know, that doesn't get removed just because you're using technology. So, and we're seeing cases of that even with like grade school where teachers are even driving by kids' houses and showing that there's some like, in-person interaction, you know, they know, they understand the importance of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a, a famous um, a famous um, research paper in, in educational psychology written by um, a University of Chicago psychologist named Benjamin Bloom. It's not a great name, Benjamin Bloom. Um, 1980s, early early 1980s, and and. What, what Bloom did is he, he looked at all the different ways of engaging with students in classrooms um, and said, of all the different ways that you can engage with, with students. So one way is to just give a lecture for an hour and then every six months test people. Um, so of all the different ways of organizing a classroom, there's one that's the best. Um, and he described what it was, it's called mastery learning. Um, and the idea behind mastery learning is that you tailor the pace of delivery of educational content to the progress of the student. You provide lots of feedback, students feedback to the instructors, instructors feedback to the, to the students. 
And, and if you do that, if you do just that one thing, you can take, you can take any population of students and move them to high performing students. Hmm. And, and there, there's a precise definition for what high performing students are. Um, and the dirty little secret in education is that this has been known for 30 years. We've known this. So Bloom's, Bloom's paper called the, the Two Sigma Problem, Bloom's paper has been known in educational circles for, for 30 years. Um, the reason that it never saw the light of day was that it's enormously expensive to do that if you don't have computers. When Bloom wrote his paper, computerization of education was in its infancy. He didn't really see that as a, as a possibility. But if you, if you take that single idea and say, I can use the power of the computer to tailor, to tailor um, um, uh, education so that it's as if every student had an individual mentor, um, then, then, then you can realize this dream. So, so you can take any group of students uh, and, and move them to the high performing category. Interesting. So yeah. students, don't be resistant to the online learning you're getting right now. Make it productive and make some suggestions. So talking about all the things that can computers can do for us, you have pioneered methods to test software and think about computers and security. You're, you're getting ready to do some new things in security. Um, this involves being able to think critically and even think differently, not being confined by how things have been done before. Um, yeah. How do students, how did you develop that skill? And then how do students develop that skill, which is really a skill that will help them throughout their careers and their lives? Uh, well, it, you, it, the skill is the right word. So, so these, these things are, uh, psychologists call them non-cognitive skills. So, so the, the, the things that, that, we, that we think of learning how to do like, like arithmetic and diagramming sentences and, and um, and, and things like that, learning a language, um, those are cognitive skills. And, and we, we, we think we understand how to learn in, in, in that environment. But, but how do you develop um, critical thinking skills? How do, you, how do you develop a personal code of ethics? How do you develop the ability to function in a, uh, in a, in a team? Um, those those are, are what are called non-cognitive skills. Um, and it turns out, it turns out that, that the success of an individual person in life depends on the degree to which they've learned these non-cognitive skills. Um, and it's especially true in the United States. Um, so so thing, things like um, uh, determination or grit, for, for example, resilience, um, um, is highly correlated with, with all kinds of success. Um, lifetime, lifetime success. Uh, among other things, it's, it's, it's highly correlated with how much money you make over your lifetime and how much money you pass on to your children and your and your children's um, children. Um, this, this thing, there's a thing called the, the, the Gatsby effect, um, and 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 the idea of the Gatsby effect is, is that if if you have high aspirations uh, and you develop the ability to live up to your potential. Um, the United States is 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 literally the best place in the world to be. Um, if you if you compare if you compare people that have equal academic records in Europe uh, or Asia um, with 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 the United States, you immediately see this difference that 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 correlation with non cognitive skills, sometimes they're called twenty first century skills, um, just just out performs every other country on earth. You, you, if, you're, if you're in Europe, um, there's a, an inherent class system that, um, that, that, that labels people pretty early on, and it doesn't matter um, how determined you are, how inquisitive you are, you're probably going to be in, in a track that is not going to lead you to become an executive at a large company, for, for example. Um, right. Um, you know, Asian Asian culture venerates the past, and 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 and, and th that means that people are, are are put into categories and 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 tracks that make it very difficult. Um, so so to a large extent, we are really fortunate to, to be living in this country in this in this time um, when we can ex you know develop those skills, 
uh, exploit those skills, use them, um, use them throughout life. But 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 you have to recognize that. You have to decide as you're as you're teaching yourself these cognitive cognitive skills, the mechanical skills, um, to consciously work on becoming a better thinker, a more critical thinker, a more ethical, uh, a more ethical person. Um, I just, for, for some reason, I found myself going to college, even though I was a science nerd, I found myself going to college at a liberal arts college, um, a, a Catholic liberal arts college, um, where, where the, 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 the monks that were teaching, the Dominican monks that were, that, that were, that were teaching at, at my college, um, just didn't give you much um, uh, leeway if, if, you, if you made a crummy argument or if you, if you gave up on, on, a, on a problem. You didn't, get, you didn't get credit for taking the easy way out of, um, out of anything. So, so I developed very early on a, a sense that these things were going to be important and I carried that with me through my career. So maybe it's for a student finding a mentor or somebody that they can really bounce ideas off of and start honing that skill. Um, someone that's there to coach, but also there to help push you. Yeah, and and you know it help it helps to be able to think about think about your own process of thinking. Um, I, I teach a class in um, in cyber ethics, uh, and it's it's. It's a class for Georgia Tech seniors, basically. It's a required class for all computer science majors, um, and and you, you would think that by the time that a Georgia Tech student gets to be a senior in college, they would have learned um, a lot of these things. And so I'm always surprised when I get up in front of a class of of, of seniors, um, and I have to explain that your opinions actually don't matter. Um, very much. Uh, what 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 matters is is um, is what you can argue uh, and 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 use to sway the opinion of other people. Uh, and and once you get over that hurdle, once you realize that oh, you know, it may feel good to 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 send out a stream of tweets that um, uh, that, that espouse some opinion. Um, it's not going to matter much. Uh, what 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 matters is is taking what was behind those tweets, making a hypothesis out of them, gathering all the evidence that you can for that hypothesis, and then marshalling those arguments to convince other people. Um, and and things like that um, don't come naturally. They they have to be learned, just like you know, swinging at a tennis ball has to be has to be learned, and playing a piano has to be has to be learned. The, the earlier that you learn it in life, the better off you are, the, the better yeah. the better you are at as you as you go along. We get we get worse and worse at that, by the way, the older we get. Yeah, learned and practiced. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned cyber ethics. Mm -hmm. Could you talk, this kind of leads me into my next question. Could you talk a little bit about the work you're doing in elections and election security right now? Um, and how your background has played a role in getting involved? Sure. Um, when I when I um, I was I was at Hewlett Packard um, around the year two thousand. Um, came back to Georgia Tech uh, in two thousand and two. Um, at exactly the time that 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 Georgia was buying its first generation of voting machines. Uh, and probably a lot of people listening today don't remember what what the presidential election in the year 2000 was was like, but it was it was um, um, it was chaos, uh, and 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 people were were trying to figure out you know, how many votes did Al Gore get in Florida um, versus George Bush, uh, because because the technology that they were using. To conduct the election was really crummy, uh, and it was it was prone to error, um, and it was frankly speaking embarrassing. And 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 Congress recognized that they passed a bill uh, in 2002 uh, called the Help America Vote Act, which provided four billion dollars uh, to the states to purchase new voting technology. Um, we all thought that was great. No one thought to ask themselves in the year 2002, what voting technology? 
there are no voting machines. Um, and so, so people rushed in to fill that vacuum. Uh, and the companies that rushed in to fill that, that vacuum um, were, were not very good companies. They, they, they weren't, they, they were privately owned. They were um, um, run, by, run by people who had obvious biases. Um, and almost immediately, almost immediately, um, people like me looking at the, at, at the state of, of voting technology were able to see huge vulnerabilities that, that, you know, if you wanted to, you could exploit to change an election, to flip votes and, and change, change election results. Um, a lot of people were working on that, on that problem in the year 2000, 2002. Um, and it, it wasn't until the 2016 elections um, that, that a lot of us kind of woke up and said, you know what, um, the, the, the threat to, to Western style democracies is not an abstract distant thing. Um, it's very likely um, that adversaries of the US uh, are taking advantage of these vulnerabilities right now. Uh, and, and so, so I got involved, uh, in a big way, uh, in, in trying to change the election technology in the state of, of Georgia, um, and nationally, um, I had, I had been an election observer for the Carter center, um, internationally and, um, had seen how election technology could be used and misused, uh, in authoritarian, um, uh, countries, uh, I helped write the, the procedures for the Carter Center um, that they use to evaluate those technologies. And then, much to my embarrassment, I turn around in my own backyard and I see exactly the same technologies being used here. Uh, and so so I, I belong to, to a number of small groups that, that are, are working on, on convincing decision makers in the government um, to, um, to not adopt technologies that are that risky. Uh, and to and to take seriously the threats to 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 elections. How do students get involved in something like this? Well, um, students find me. Um, we're, we're we're doing. How do they um, find you? <laughs> um, well, I get I get I get um, I get criticized by the Secretary of State's office, uh, and and I find myself uh, in battles in, in newspapers with um, with election officials. So so I guess my profile is. Is, is high enough so people find me, um, but we also do projects. So, so one of our one of our current projects um, is with with Fulton County. Um, everyone remembers um, this is the not distance past, past, past though. This is this is June. Everyone remembers the primary election in June when all the long lines um, were getting national play. Um, Georgia was kind of embarrassed by by the fact that we had a chaotic election um, and. Uh, I, I started a project to re-engineer the polling places in Fulton County. You know, Fulton County was one of the one of the epicenters, I think, of chaos uh, this this summer. Um, so, so we established a partnership with with Fulton County to um, uh, to redesign the polling places so that they were first of all safe places. Um, you know, this is a pandemic. We can't we can't. Uh, just all kind of crowd into a local high school gymnasium to vote, uh, and um, and we're not going to do that. Um, and and because physical polling places have to be managed by people, we look at at the vulnerability of, of poll workers. Poll workers tend to be people my age, um, people who are retired, um, and they're spending all day long uh, uh, inside a small cramped room with a, a good circulation. Um, um, without special measures, they're going to get sick. They're going to their yeah. their their health is going to is going to suffer. So so we have we have at um, at Georgia Tech specialists that know how to do this, uh, know how to design um, um, classrooms, polling places, whatever they they they, they might be, um, to to maximize the safety of workers and, and visitors, um, and at the same time, um, make sure that the elections are secure. And, and that that your your privacy as a voter uh, isn't isn't compromised. So I put out a call um, to Georgia Tech students um, in late June, saying, "Hey, we have this project. Um, 
we're looking for volunteers to help out with the with the project and and the um, uh, the feedback was tremendous. I mean, we, we we just we, we had more more interest from students than we could um, we could imagine. Uh, we have a group of students out right now this afternoon um, at early voting places, uh, taking 3D 3D imagery of the polling places, coming back and running through their software to figure out where the voting machines should be placed, um, how, the, how the traffic flows um, flows in and out, and you'll see that if you vote in Fulton County, you'll see that in the elections this, this fall. I'll be watching out for it. <laughs> um, it's really cool because you've taken a topic, security, uh, computer security really, um, something that you started your career with and you have come full circle and are now basically working in that field again in a very different way, in a very uh, applied way um, so it's really cool. You know, the foundation that mom and I have, um, for everybody who doesn't know, we have a foundation and uh, Rich is on the board. It's called the Campus Community Partnership Foundation. And we have a program that actually gets students to take what they're learning in school and apply it to a community need or problem so that they learn that you can use your skills for something besides just what you think traditionally can be your job path. So. I think it's so cool that you're really doing something different with the same skill set. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really it's it turned it's turned out to be a, a full circle. People that are, are are watching what's going on at Georgia Tech these days with the creation of the new school for cybersecurity and say, well, you know, that, that's almost poetic that 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 you know I came back I came back to Georgia Tech um, to direct a, a cybersecurity center, and here I am now, twenty years later, um, doing it again. Yeah, it's really cool that you're starting yet another thing. At yeah, 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 yeah. Never, never too late to start something new. I can't wait to see the statue that they make to you at Georgia Tech. I'm going to lobby for that. A virtual statue. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Right now it can be virtual. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, so we've yeah. got student questions, and I'd love to get to a few of these Sure. Um, since that's who we're here for. Um, Emily would like to know which has been more valuable in your career, your education or your experience. Um, so I, it's hard for me to separate to separate the, the, the two. Um, if, if by education you mean classroom um, uh, education, um, to be honest, um, classroom education isn't what I normally think of when I think of, of how my skills my skills developed. Uh, I did a lot. I did a lot because I, I was allowed to play, uh, and and so I learned enough to be able to to, to play without without uh, uh, without damaging things. But but um, it's it's when you it's when you take those skills those those you know, kind of hard skills uh, and find a problem that people care about um, that that you see things come into action. It's it's there are all kinds of textbook exercises that you can carry out. To learn, to learn the skill. Um, most of those exercises aren't going to benefit humanity at all. Um, when you step out of that box and say, well, what what else can I do with these tools? Uh, can I do something that, that someone actually cares about? Then then you provide a lot of internal motivation uh, for, for, for Further honing your skills, you're making sure that the technology is applied well. So, so I, I think I, I, I come down on the side of experience, um, um, but it, it's to be honest, a cycle. I mean, you, you you pretty soon bump up against the limits of what you know, and you have to go back and acquire new, new knowledge and new skills. A lifelong student, right? Life, yeah. Life, you we, talk in fact, about we, yeah. yeah we so just you talk about in your book. Yeah, we we just we just finished a, a strategy document at Georgia Tech called the Lifetime Commitment, and the idea is that is that people aren't thinking of college as a place where you show up as an 18 year old anymore. Um, we see we see students when they're in middle school, sometimes elementary school, um, and 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 they stay with us for their entire lifetime. Uh, and so thinking about four years of college and the degree and going out to work for 60 years, I think, is an old concept. Yeah. Uh, to be continually involved in the lifetimes of your students. Yep. 
Yep. Uh, Taylor would like to know, how do you think this pandemic will change and shape our lives long-term and short-term? Um, you know, I, if, if I, if I had any answers to those questions, um, <laughs> I'd, I'd be, I'd be out um, um, working, working. I, I think, I think the, the, the one thing that, that I don't know if most people agree on, but the, 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 the one thing that seems obvious to me um, is that is we can't unring the bell. So, so the, the, the things that we thought would never happen have happened. Um, you know, we, 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 have, we have entered a Ray Bradbury world where um, Ray Bradbury wrote, wrote a series of short stories, um, some of which involved people living separately in remote places and never getting together except for, for rare, rare events. Uh, so we've entered that, 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 that world. And we, we, had, had, we had to figure out how to bridge, um, uh, bridge gaps and bridge, bridge distances. And, um, you know that's going to stay with us forever. What we do with it, I think, is is yet to be determined. And, and so the next generation of leaders have to figure out what do we do with this. So if we if, if we if we have Zoom that's entered our vocabulary, um, what kinds of things can we uh, can we Zoom and how do we how do we do that? Uh, you see a lot of a lot of controversy in higher education colleges trying to decide how to deliver their courses. Um, Remotely, uh, and it's in a sense the wrong question. With what you, what you have to decide is 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 now that people physically cannot get together, um, how do you maximize the use of the technology to make that experience better or different than it would have been had they been able to get together before? Right. Asking the right question. Yep. Um, let's see. Michael would like to know what is the coolest thing you have worked on in your career? Oh, wow. Um, That's a good question. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good, it's a really good question. Um, so, um, I, I think, I think this last, this last, um, um, Round of technology development that we did around education um, was really was really it was most gratifying. It, it, it wasn't that the technology was so unbelievably cool; it's what we did with it um, was 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 cool. So we we started um, um, with with kind of a, a crazy idea that we could take the Georgia Tech catalog um, and open it up to the rest of the world. Um, for free, um, so the for free part, we'll have to come back and talk about that. But 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 we we started out with a set of committed professors um, who said, you know, I really love this course that I teach, um, and I, and I think I think everyone in the world should have access to this to this course. Um, that we started that process in the summer of 2011. Um, three years later, we had three million people. Three million people enrolled in those in those in those classes, and it was it was it was it was such a cool experience um, that that the guy who came after me as dean of the College of Computing says, "I want to build a degree program like that," and so he started uh, a graduate degree program, a master's degree program um, in computer science using exactly the same technology. Today, Georgia Tech educates eight percent of the graduate students in computer science in the country. Um, it's, it's the largest master's program in the world. Wow. Um, it, it, um, uh, it enrolls students who, who, first of all, are really good students. They have to get into Georgia Tech in order to, to enter into, into the program. Um, but, but to a student, to, to a, a, a person, they are students that wouldn't have at, had access to that quality level of education without this program. And we hear that every day. We, we, get, we get email. They show up on campus. They don't have to show up on campus. Um, but in, in non-pandemic times, they showed up on campus to walk across the stage because this was an opportunity to get, to get a high-quality education that they wouldn't have 
um, wouldn't have had before. And so, so to see that progress from, from a gleam in someone's eye um, to this thing that now affects thousands and thousands of people uh, is, is just, is a, it's, it, it, as, an, as an educator, as a scientist, it, it's one of those things that, that is like the perfect experiment. You've seen, you, you, you've, seen, you've, seen the, you've seen the outcome, you've seen what effect it has on people. Yeah, yeah, it must be very uh, fulfilling that you've had yeah. such an impact. Yeah. Um, John would like to know, are you discouraged about what you see in the world today? Um, so I don't, I don't feel great uh, about everything I, <laughs> I, I see in, in, in the world today, but, but, but I, I am by nature an optimistic person. Um, uh, and so, so one of these, one of these non-cognitive skills that I talked about a little while ago is something called self-efficacy. Um, what is self-efficacy? Self-efficacy is a core belief that you can meet any challenge. Uh, and, and, and how do you, how do you develop self-efficacy? You challenge yourself continually and you start when you're a very young person, you try to solve hard problems. You try to do difficult things. Sometimes you succeed. Sometimes you um, you fail. But you always get better as it as it as you go along. Um, so so people that that have self efficacy tend to be people that 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 have big dreams that 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 they may not necessarily know exactly how they're going to go after them, um, but they're not afraid of them. Uh, and so developing that kind of fearlessness. Just I think is a is a big part of the um, a big part of the the, the, the growing process. Um, you know that's that's the thing that's the thing I keep coming back to. I'm I'm, I'm writing an, another book, uh, and and it it leads off with stories of, of people that were uh, that were heroes of mine. You know, like the scientists driving across the desert in the old 1950s science fiction. I, so I knew some of those people. Uh, I, wor I worked for some of those uh, some of those people, and they all had that characteristic that 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 they were that they were people that, that weren't afraid of the difficulty of the problem. They were gonna keep working on that problem regardless of what, what the challenges were. Hmm. Interesting. Um, we have a fun question. Um, let's see. Nathan would like to know what your favorite sci-fi movie is. Oh, my favorite sci-fi movie. Um, Very topical. Yeah. So, so the, the the one that sticks with me um, the most is uh, when worlds collide, mm -hmm. um, and and I'll, I'll I'll tell you why it, it keeps coming back. But when worlds collide was this old science fiction novel where, or this story where where um, you know some scientist figures out oh the Earth is going to be struck by an asteroid and everyone's going to die, uh, and we have five years to build a rocket ship that gets everyone. Um, off the off the earth, uh, and um, of course they're only partially successful um, at, at, at doing it. Um, but but it, it 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 has all the all the elements that appeal to to um, pre adolescent boy. Um, you know you're going off on, a, on an adventure and this this, this unmistakable uh, unmistakable challenge. Um, but but it it turned out to be a, a movie that has lots of role models in it. Um, so, so, so scientists, scientists who, um, who are able to kind of get above their, their laboratory glassware and, um, and, and spectacles, uh, and, and, and see what's going on in the world around them. And then, and then take on the, 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 the scientific battles, the political battles, the, um, the fundraising battles that it takes to be, to be successful. So, so that, that, that's a movie that it, it's not, it's not one of the world's classic. Um, films in, in, in science fiction, but it, it, it's one that just for some reason is a touch point uh, for me. And I, I use it as a metaphor. And a lot of the things that I write, I use when worlds collide as a metaphor for what um, what the challenges really are. Hmm. I will definitely have to look that one up this weekend. Um, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure I will love it. Okay, so one more question, very specific, about AI from mm -hmm. Gabrielle. Yep. I can't believe we've gotten this entire conversation about talking about computers and we have not really mentioned in name AI. So 
She says, AI is so popular right now. If I was going to specialize in a particular part of the field, what should it be? Um, a particular part of AI? Um, so, um, you know, come and talk to me. Uh, I, we, 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 <laughs> we, we, we have a project um, that involves using uh, AI uh, to augment mentors um, in the classroom. So if you, if you, if you have these, these big online, uh, online classrooms, um, you eventually get to the point where where the the, the, the volume of, of of conversation, the volume of in, of interactions, is larger than you can recruit people um, to to manage. So so we we started a project five years ago called the Jill Watson um, project. So so Watson is this IBM AI uh, system that that is famous because the the um, Watson won Jeopardy um, and beat all the human human contestants at, at, at Jeopardy. Um, and so so I have a colleague um, who had connections to IBM and 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 we used Watson um, to see whether or not we could um, we could augment how well we mentor students in these online classes. And so he he introduced um, a new teaching assistant at Georgia Tech whose name was Jill Watson. Um, so, 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 so Jill just kind of got plopped into the into the mix of other teaching assistants for this for this online class, um, and um, um, he watched to see what happened. And 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 uh, it turns out that that Jill did a really good job. Um, you know, if you, if you if you read Jill's evaluations as a teaching assistant, the students said you know Jill was was always pleasant. Um, um, <laughs> she 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 always seemed to be online. Some <laughs> Some students, because because they're, they're Georgia Tech students, kind of had a sneaking suspicion that maybe Jill was was not everything she was cracked up to be. That maybe she was an, an AI, but really no one no one figured um, figured it, it out. Um, um, Jill was asked out on dates, um, but but it 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 was it was really the first demonstration um, of. Of this thing called the Turing test, which is which is can you replace a human being with an artificial intelligence and not have the other person know it? So if you you can fool a human being, that's one of the signs, one of the classical signs that that you pass the Turing test, that that you have something that that is genuinely behaving as if it were uh, if it were intelligent. Um, and so we've been running with this project now for 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 five years, and and there's there's quite an extensive group of people. Maybe, maybe the, the largest in the world devoted to this topic uh, at Georgia Tech that's looking at educational applications um, of, of AI. We've just started to scratch the surface uh, on hmm. this. It, it, it really is very exciting. Yeah, it definitely feels like education is getting a uh, rebirth in terms of ed tech and all the things happening in the space, like because of the pandemic and online education. Um, it's seeing a resurgence. So hopefully, yeah, yeah, yeah. hopefully yeah. that will lead to really positive things. Uh, Rich, I really want to thank you for spending time with us today and for answering the students' questions. Um, is there anything you'd like to say to the students as we close out? Uh, well, so I, I think, I think you, you said it well, we, we, we were living in a time when, when you question the assumptions um, that, that you lived with up until now. Um, that's that's always scary, um, but but it means that there are opportunities that are going to open up that that, that didn't exist um, before. Um, this is a time when we need education. The societal challenges are going to be huge coming out of this pandemic. Um, you know, every, everything from healthcare to education to to rebuilding uh, economies and, re and rebuilding trust. And I think technology needs to play a role uh, in in that. So I hope those of you. Uh, who are interested in in science and technology will take that to heart uh, and direct some of your talents towards these future challenges. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we need all the positive thinking and great minds, young minds thinking outside the box on these things. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, so next week, everybody, uh, we have a great guest coming up, Jasmine Atherton. Um, she is a mastermind when it comes to marketing and social media. She worked for some huge brands like Airbnb, Delta. Um, so 
she'll be coming up next week. Um, we're out of time for today, but you can find us everywhere on the web. Uh, just search Supernova Commencements, hashtag Super Supernova Commencements, and on our website, supernovacommencements.com. You might notice a theme there. So we're making it super easy for you to find us. Uh, graduates, welcome to the work world. Um, let us know what questions you have and how we can help you on your journey. And students that are back at school, remember it's online education, not remote education. So um, get involved, give your teachers feedback and really make the most out of this year because it can be a very, very positive experience. Um, remember it's a blessing to be a blessing, stay happy, safe, healthy, and be kind to everybody. See you guys next time. <laughs>